Yeah. It is a very big pleasure for me to welcome Professor Eric Richter here to the podcast in this series of high performance papers. Welcome, Eric. Thank you very much, Lars. And uh, we will today focus on uh, this paper that I have uh, highlighted here in the in the green exercise GLUT4 and skeletal muscle glucose uptake. Yeah. And uh, this indeed qualifies for a high performance paper in, in my book because uh, first of all, it's published in a very uh, high impact uh, factor journal. And uh, even with that in mind, it outbeats the average uh, citation numbers by at least that factor through uh, to, I mean, uh, Google citation always pick up more citation that, than uh, Web of Science, but even uh, with that. So uh, I think that this uh, very uh, comprehensive review, which so to say summarize, of course, 10 years ago, uh, a lot of your research is very uh, elegant and uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading it. Well, thank you very much, Lars. It's, uh, as you say, it's uh, 10 years ago we published it. so. Something has happened <laughs> since then, not a lot, but something has happened. And uh, I guess it, it testifies uh, my interest in, in muscle glucose uptake, uh, particularly in relation to exercise. Indeed, indeed. And uh, maybe before we uh, or when starting digging into the paper, why is it that uh, GLUT4 is such an interesting and important uh, protein in, in terms of glucose uptake and exercise in particular? Yeah, so so GLUT4 is a glucose transporter number four, and there are approximately 12 different uh, glucose transporters uh, expressed in, in humans, but this is a very special transporter. And uh, I guess it's related to, to exercise and insulin-induced glucose uptake. And we, we've known for more than 100 years, and when you exercise, then the muscle glucose uptake increases. And that's, of course, interesting in terms of of uh, providing fuel for the exercising muscle, but it is also uh, interesting in a more uh, clinical setting, you might say, because we know that, uh, for instance, in an insulin-resistant organism where where insulin doesn't work very well, we still have uh, exercise that works normally. So you can say it's a it's in an ins insulin resistant organism. This is an alternative uh, signaling pathway to increase uh, glucose uptake. But so we've known that for many years, and it was about thirty, a little more than thirty years ago, that it was, uh, or actually more than thirty years ago, that we people found out that glucose transport was uh, mediated by a transporter, and. Uh, about uh, 30 years ago, it was cloned by David James, the GLUT4 transporter. And it is unique in the way that, uh, first of all, of course, it transports uh, glucose, but also that it is a, a transporter that translocates from the inside of the muscle cell to the cell membrane, where it actually uh, can transport glucose across the cell membrane because the cell membrane is more or less impermeable to glucose if there is no transporter to transport it across. So, so yeah, because yeah. as you also mentioned in, in the review, there are some findings in, uh, in knockout mice that I it's, mean, if they don't have this uh, protein expressed, then their uptake during exercise is much reduced. Yes, yes, it's almost zero. But, but you can still you can still transport some glucose into the muscle in resting conditions, I guess, through GLUT, GLUT1 and some of the other transporters. So how about the ability to store glycogen? I mean, it will probably be, 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 be delayed, but you can still do it. You can still do it, but it will be much uh, delayed uh, compared to a muscle yeah. that has GLUT4, of course, yes. But if we dwell a little upon this, uh, and also I picked this, or you uh, suggested this figure from an updated uh, review or, or perspective paper, uh, that that the uptake of glucose can increase by a 100-fold. And you can say, okay, there's you you speculate upon, about, about the different mechanisms. Increased delivery, the transport across the 
the, the membrane where CLIM4, of course, uh, plays an important role. And then, of course, the, the, the metabolism, the combustions of, 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 of glucose inside the muscle. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, of course, the translocation, because GLUT4 is in the resting condition, partly or most of it located in, in, inside, in, in the vesicles inside the, the muscle. Yeah. Um, and then you have the translocation. That's right. So, so upon muscle contractions, then the glucose transporters, GLUT4, they move from this uh, intracellular storage site to the cell membrane. And that translocation <clears throat> process is, is important. But uh, in the bottom of the figure, you can say that, as you alluded to, that it's been difficult, at least in, in humans, to really get a large increase in GLUT4 at the membrane with exercise. And that contrasts, as is shown on the, on the bottom, to the up to a hundredfold increase in glucose uptake that people have measured uh, during intense exercise. So there's a little bit of a mismatch between the increase in glucose uptake and the fold increase in glucose on the cell, on the cell membrane. Yeah. And therefore, and can, you, can you block the translocation so that you could identify? Okay, if you don't have the translocation, how much would the uptake be uh, be reduced? Has that been done ever? Uh, I don't think so. No, um, because but... in 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 this up uh, review, you in in uh, AGP, you also have a figure showing nicely how. Uh, the amount of GLUT4 in, in translocated correlates to the uptake of, uh, of uh, deoxy uh, glucose, uh, indicating, of course, that if you didn't have this translocation, it would be lower. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It would, it, we know that GLUT4 translocation is necessary for glucose uptake during muscle contractions, but <clears throat> Whether it's the only thing uh, that that relates or that regulates glucose uptake, it's it's probably not because, as you say, there are lots of other uh, things happening during exercise. And if we go to the top uh, figure, there are there are several uh, things that regulate. For instance, the increase in blood flow that yeah. uh, is uh, occurring during exercise is very important to keep the interstitial glucose concentration fairly high because in the interstitial glucose concentration is the concentration that is outside the muscle uh, membrane and uh, therefore the, the increase in, in, in blood flow is, is very important. We think that in, glucose... in terms of oxygen deli or, or glucose delivery, yeah, of course. Glucose delivery and I, also I, I was a little surprised in in uh, in the review that you also wrote that I mean because insulin is depressed hmm. uh, that you also have an increased delivery of insulin. I thought I always thought of that as being the concentration whether it binds to the membrane or not. Uh, but is delivery of insulin actually also important? I mean. Oh, well, and this translocation, you also described that it comes from two different pools. Yeah. And, the, and of course, the, the contraction-induced translocation, I guess, would be the one having the biggest role doing active exercise. Sure. Well, whether uh, insulin is is important or not, I mean, if, if, you, if you look at very insulin-deficient diabetic patients or diabetic dogs where insulin is zero, then uh, glucose transport is still occurring during exercise, but it is actually decreased somewhat compared to when insulin is normal, even though it decreases with exercise. So there is something going on, but it it may not just be the insulin concentration because also when insulin is very low in a diabetic organism, free fatty acids are very high, and we know that they uh, tend to decrease glucose uptake. So it's very complicated. But if, if you if you have an in vitro system, in vitro system where there's absolutely no insulin and you stimulate the muscle to contract, you will still see a large increase in glucose uh, transport into the muscle, even in the complete absence of insulin. So insulin is not imp important, but it may still have a little bit of a regulatory role in vivo during normal conditions. Yeah. But also to put a little into perspective how important this increase in glucose uptake uh, during exercises. We did a, an experiment with six hours of, uh, of uh, bicycling uh, where we provided, uh, we, we wanted to mimic what 
the the cycling athletes do during these prolonged races and we gave them 90 grams of of uh, carbohydrate an hour and it seems that they metabolize it because you don't have any accumulation and there has also been other studies showing that you you can actually take up all these large amounts in the older day it was considered to be lower but now i mm. think that some even surpasses this and that can cover approximately uh, half of their energy turnover uh, during you could say the prolonged phases where these cyclists still do 240 watts or so and then the remaining of it actually comes from fat combustion even in yeah. spite of this high intake and it shows that you can then spare the muscle glycogen to the more intense parts it's clear that when the in, the exercise becomes very intense then that becomes a major fuel sure. but i mean this hundredfold and it would be difficult to imagine that if if the if they haven't because as we will also uh, touch upon there's an upregulation in the expression of brute force with training mm. uh, and in in these highly trained I mean they it it appears that they have the the capacity to take it up. Um, mm. Oh yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. And we also know from from studies with the isotopes that if you are cycling for for a long time and you uh, you in you int you you uh, take in a lot of glucose, and then of course the, the plasma insulin will also go a little bit up, not a lot, but a little bit, and that probably also helps to uh, get the uh, glucose into the muscle because, I mean, insulin and contractions use different signaling pathways, and therefore they they have an additive effect on on glucose uptake. Yeah, I know that you in resting conditions when you investigate uh, insulin sensitivity following exercise uh, and so on, use a clamp where you induce with very high uh, level or at least increased levels of. Have you ever done this during exercise? I mean, can you drive the in 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 the to larger levels than a hundredfold if you also have high insulin? Because I mean, yeah, probably we haven't done it, but it's been done by others and and. Uh... I don't think it's been done during maximal exercise, or it hasn't been done during maximal exercise. No. But if you do it during during submaximal, you do get an additive effect of contraction-induced glucose uptake and insulin-induced glucose uptake. Okay. So that's no, but but I also guess that the the uh, the highest uh, glucose uptake from the bloodstream into the muscle would be during submaximal, because if you do very intense exercise, wouldn't you have some sort of uh, I mean, because you 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 increase the the glycologists and the breakdown of glycogen so much that you could have some uh, accumulation of free glucose within the muscle. I mean, most of that yeah. would of course be G uh, six uh, glucose, but I mean, uh, yeah, there are some, but actually, some of the highest uh, uptake rates have been measured in uh, people that do very high in intensity exercise. So. Okay. So yeah. you're right that that there could be some uh, phosphorylation mm -hmm. break on on glucose uptake, but it still seems to <laughs> to get in uh, when you do very intense exercise. So, yeah. Okay. So, but the supply, the transport, and the metabolism, as you also mm -hmm. touch upon in 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 the, in the review, are the three where there could be potential limitations uh, during exercise. Yeah. And then, yeah, of course, absolutely. you also have the very important and which have of interest in in terms of recovery uh, than in the post uh, exercise period and there i guess you have a, a combination of the translocation through insulin and the remains from the previous exercise that you already have some of the translocation there yeah it, it depends how long time after the termination of exercise you look because we know that the exercise induced glucose uptake it disappears fairly rapidly within a few hours uh, normally. And then what we usually do is to look at insulin sensitivity three to four to five hours following exercise. And at that time, the contraction-induced glucose uptake has disappeared, so it, it's very low. But when you then stimulate with insulin, either with a clamp or during a meal, you will see that the uh, glucose uptake uh, is much higher in, in muscles that have exercised compared to muscles that haven't exercised. So there's a large increase in insulin sensitivity in the muscles that have actually exercised. And that is uh, has been shown to be due to a bigger translocation. So insulin works much better in a muscle that has exercised compared to a muscle that hasn't exercised. And that, of course, makes physiological sense because you need 
the high glucose uptake following exercise to replenish your glycogen stores. And how long does this, uh, you could say, acute effect of an exercise bout last? Yeah, <laughs> people always ask that question, Lars, and it's uh, the longest it's been shown to last is 48 hours. Uh, that was a study made made by Cora Mikines uh, many years ago. And uh, we we probably think that it depends on the exercise intensity, the exercise duration, and so on. So it and, and least, probably also the mode, because if you do a lot of uh, eccentric exercise, then you could have a suppression uh, of that. That's effect. right. You you actually if you make if you induce muscle damage via uh, muscle damaging eccentric exercise, you actually become insulin resistance. We've shown that also many years ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, it depends what you do, of course, and and that's uh, very interesting. Yeah. So so that's the acute effect. But maybe and also if we show the next slide, could you also have a permanent effect? Because I mean, uh, as shown here in in one example where you also, as you elaborate on in in the review, have an increase after training, and in particularly in the in the type one fibers, probably due to the training mode there. But but we see an a, we also did a study where we saw quite actually, a, I think it was almost a doubling of the GLUT4 expression. So could you also have a more permanent effect that when yeah. you do regular training, then you upregulate them? Are they then, I mean, one thing is that you have a larger pool, but are they also easier to recruit? Well, you you do get a larger pool. And in, in this this study we, you've shown here on the left, you we did a training study where we primarily recruited uh, type 1 muscle fibers. And you can see that the increase in uh, uh, GLUT4 is actually only occurring in the fibers that were recruited. And you can also see that maybe surprisingly uh, that type 1 fibers that are actually more oxidative than the type 2 fibers, they actually have the highest uh, GLUT4 expression level. And they are usually thought to be more insulin sens sensitive also. Yeah. But of course, um, so you do get more GLUT4, mm -hmm. and if you train uh, with high intensity, you also get a increased GLUT4 in the other five types. And this leads to a well-known uh, increased insulin sensitivity in, in, uh, muscle that, in muscle that is very well trained. And that is probably mostly due to the, the high... Uh, GLUT4 expression, but there are also other things that happen with training, for instance, increased capillarization and increased hexokinase, for instance, so that you are able to take care of all the glucose that is yeah. coming in. So you stimulate, so to say, all of the three, you both have an increase in the, you could say, area available yeah. for diffusion, the transporter yes. in itself, and then the, and the internal metabolism. handling. Yeah. yeah. So what is your take? What is the the the... The, the stimuli that uh, that uh, increase this glut I, I believe that is, and I also think that Hargraves, which you wrote this uh, review with, uh, was one of the co-authors on that paper, which showed mm -hmm. that you have an increase in uh, in uh, glut four uh, RNA uh, signaling expression uh, yeah. following exercise, and that that was further stimulated if you if there so to say were sort of energy crisis in the, in the muscle. So is it low? Uh, glycogen is it low uh, ATP yeah. ATP ratio? So what is it that that is the main stimuli for this? Yeah, that it's probably more complicated than, than we think, but at least uh, there seems to be two major pathways as also shown on on the figure. So one is uh, through energy, uh, you could call it crisis, but maybe that's not the right word. But energy depletion that does happen during exercise and you activate AMP kinase that then leads to uh, to uh, changes in uh, transcription factors that are uh, sitting on the promoter region for the GLUT4 gene. So AMP kinase is, is probably important, but also the calcium, the increase in calcium that we know happens during exercise, otherwise the muscle will not contract. That also seems to be uh, imp important via the CAM kinase 2. And these two, at least, are, are the major, probably the major routes by which you induce a GLUT4 gene expression and therefore more GLUT4 gene uh, or GLUT4 protein. But there are probably other, other pathways uh, that are involved.
So calcium plays a role is, is GLUT4 upregulated both following, uh, I mean, you could say more aerobic type of exercise, but also following strength training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it doesn't seem to matter what you're doing. You can do high intensity interval training or strength training or endurance training. Everything okay. seems to uh, increase GLUT4. No, no. And in, in, in the terms of strength training, you would both have a, a large muscle mass for handling the glucose. And if you then also increase this, so uh, that makes sense. Yeah. That, that could also be, an, uh, at least from health or increased insulin mm -hmm. sensitivity perspective of, of importance. Absolutely. Uh, then I know that as uh, some of your research has also focused on establishing by what methods and pathways that the GLUT4 is then translocated. Uh, has there been any major advantages in understanding? You you also read in, uh, uh, write in, in in the review that uh, that that is not completely uh, understood, and whether there are two different pathways and how they merge, or if they recruit the different pools from the contraction, respectively, the into insulin induced. Uh, yeah, yeah. So so for many years, it was thought that calcium was uh, the main stimulate and that might still uh, be true to some extent. AMP kinase has also been involved a lot and uh, <laughs> because we know that if you stimulate AMP kinase in a resting muscle, you can do that with uh, with some drugs, then you see an increase in glucose uptake in a resting muscle. And as we know that AMP kinase is activated during exercise, it makes sense to think that this increase in AMP kinase activity also regulates glucose uptake. But it's been pretty difficult to show in knockout uh, animals. So if you knock out AMP kinase, then most of the studies show that glucose uptake is still normal. Some studies show it's decreased. And uh, it's, I would say it's not totally clear really what AMP kinase does during exercise. But we know from, from studies that it uh, actually is important following exercise so that that the increase in glucose uptake that that occurs after exercise is uh, to some extent regulated by MP kinase. But there are different, uh, some years ago, uh, Carlos Wolkin uh, uh, in our lab with Thomas Jensen showed that uh, ROS production is probably also important for glucose uptake via the uh, GTPase RAC1 that we've worked with for many years or several years now. And that seems to add an additional layer of regulation of glucose uptake uh, during exercise. So there's, there, I think the, the current understanding is that there are many different pathways that actually can stimulate glucose uptake during exercise. And some of them you could call are redundant so that if one uh, mechanism is not working that well, then you recruit other mechanisms. So therefore it's also somewhat difficult to figure out are they really important? Are they not so important? So, so that's I think that is, is we still we still have some work to do to figure out exactly how the different pathways uh, work together and how they uh, regulate glucose uptake. And, and could that be of importance for you? Could say medical treatment of uh, people with metabolic disorders. I mean, instead of stimulating the insulin receptor through either agonists or uh, or so on, then you could target some of the pathways down. I mean, Absolutely. From, from the natural perspective, is it nice that, that you could say exercise upregulates all of them? But I mean, in, in these terms, it could be important to target some of these. Yeah, or is so, that already a, a, a pathway that has been... Uh, well, I mean, it, it, there's been the thought about what we call exercise in a pill, right, where you can... You the idea is if you know which pathways, which molecular pathways that increase glucose uptake in a muscle during exercise, if you could then pharmacologically stimulate them, then you would also get increased glucose uptake. And and I mean there are in, there is still interest in in this in this uh, idea. And for instance, AMP kinase has been has been uh, researched a lot to be maybe a. a molecule that you could activate with, with drugs and therefore increase glucose uptake. So there is interest, of course, because it is, as I said in the beginning, it is an alternative pathway to the insulin signaling pathway. And therefore, if you could uh, activate it pharmacologically, then 
yeah you might have some benefits but uh, so far it has not on the other hand you could say if you don't do the exercise if you don't increase metabolism then you would just have the accumulation and yeah. then you could say then you would probably fed up the i mean at some instance i mean if glycogen goes uh, very high mm -hmm. uh, i mean then you cannot store more in the muscles and then you would still stimulate and store it otherwise or it yeah, would yeah. accumulate in the in, in the we know screen. for instance in the heart that a glycogen accu accumulation is not very good for the heart also in muscles, there are some glycogen storage diseases that are known. So if you have too much glycogen, you do get some problems uh, in the muscle. So, yeah, it's not an easy, it's not an uh -huh. easy. How is uh, it with myocardial patients? Do they downregulate uh, the expression of GLUT4? Because, I mean, the muscle is, so to say, fed up. Yeah, no, no, they have, a, we've we've looked at that as well. They have a normal GLUT4, and, but they have, and then they are actually a little bit insulin resistant, but their glucose uptake is is pretty high during exercise, actually. <laughs> That's yeah, because they, because... yeah, yeah, they have to rely on all what they can get from the bloodstream yeah, because exactly. they can't use the, the glycogen exactly. in the muscle. Exactly. Oh, okay. So, so, yeah, anyway. So you could ask, I mean, last you could ask the question, which is the larger stimulator of glucose uptake? Is it muscle contractions or is it insulin which one which of the two mechanisms is more powerful and uh, that <laughs> uh, that is uh, we've actually looked at that and we we uh, looked in in healthy young males we exercised them for uh, at about 65 percent of their view two max so two-thirds of maximum and then after and another day we actually did a clamp where we increased the insulin concentration to about two thirds of the maximum value, without okay. further uh, of, of without planning. exercise. Yeah. yeah. So just to see if if two thirds of maximal insulin is better or worse than two thirds of maximal exercise, and for the exercise community, it's nice to know that exercise really won out big time. It's about twice as efficient to increase glucose uptake than yeah. insulin. No, no, but I also have some anecdotal where you in people who has type two diabetes, I mean, uh, classified as, as that. And I mean, you can completely treat it with, with diet and exercise because I mean, the exercise part, if you do it regularly, I mean, and you don't eat too much sugar, then you can actually get all of the sugar away from the bloodstream just by, by doing exercise, even though the probably, of course, if you keep doing it, then your some of your insulin resistance will probably disappear because you upregulate all of these systems that we have talked mm -hmm. about. But I mean, quite, quite fast, you can get from the acute effect. Uh, so Sure. Uh, so that's quite nice. Mm -hmm. So I know that it's a very big job to do uh, comprehensive reviews like uh, like this. But if you were about to do it again, I mean, uh, what would be the major updates uh, that uh, that we would have, and can we look forward to an an updated uh, comprehensive physiological uh, review uh, in 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 this area from your side? Um, maybe, yeah. <laughs> we are we are actually talking with the editors about it, um, yeah. but um, the major upregulations. Well, I guess the signaling during exercise is probably where we know more than we did uh, in uh, 2013. That's uh, a major part. Yeah. There's also uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how glucose actually gets out of the capillary. And we have for many years thought that it's just due to some some pores or some slits between the endothelial cells. So it's yeah. like a sieve, and that's probably still correct. But because uh, people have found that endothelial cells, they mm -hmm. express quite a lot of GLUT1, which is another glucose transporter. Yeah, yeah. Then okay. the idea was then that maybe some of the glucose was taken up by transporters as well and, and transported across the endothelial cells. So we've actually looked at that in endothelial GLUT1 knockout uh, mice. And uh, fortunately, I would say it still looks like by far the, the major part of uh, glucose is leaving through these slits or pores uh, that are between the muscles and we, we, I mean, between the endothelial cells. Yeah, but so it was really, that was not limited, that it could get into the interstitium. 
No, no. So it's 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 it uh, seems to be fairly uh, fairly easily to uh, exit the uh, the uh, capillaries, but but there's still work to do because it seems like maybe perhaps this, the size of the slits may actually be a little bit uh, regulated. So that is another very important uh, step to look at. Uh, it yeah, yeah. And, I mean, we know that training can indeed uh, induce a very large uh, difference in capitalization. So, I mean, mm -hmm. um, we always thought of that, so to say, by a quantitative mechanism. It increases yeah. the area and the number and so on, but it could maybe also be some qualitative. Uh, okay. uh, that's yeah. very interesting. We will uh, look forward <laughs> to that. Yeah. Maybe. Um so I think that we have uh, touched upon a lot of it. And I think that also I would, we always recommend, of course, that after people have listened to this talk, that they dig into the paper and uh, they enjoy how they get both, so to say, some of the quantitative aspects of how much does it increase uh, from a very small amount when the need is low in, in a resting and you can say also overnight faced uh, conditions when, when the, the need for uh, for for transporting glucose into the muscle is low, and what happens then with the exercise and post exercise? To later in the review, where you get a more go into all of the details and about what the regulatory mechanisms are uh, responsible for the translocation, and also here for the increased uh, expression following training. So I think that that people should really dig into that, and uh, and hopefully they will enjoy reading the review as much as I did. Uh, and uh, that they can look forward to a, to a follow-up sometime maybe. Sometime uh, we, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we cannot promise, we'll but uh, that would be uh, really interesting, I think. Yep. But so, uh, uh, cool. thank you very much for taking us uh, around this uh, paper here in the yeah, series no of, uh, of high-performance papers, which we, we, we can always discuss what is high impact and, and so on, but at least... Uh, it's nice to know that your work is uh, well received out there, and it uh, it certainly signifies that when it picks up so many uh, citations here. So uh, thank you very much for your contribution to this, Eric. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be part of your series here. So thank you very much, Lars. Welcome. <laughs>